My name is Josh Miller. I own Riverstone Kennels, and I've been training gun dogs for more than 16 years. I have field trialed, I've hunt tested, but at the end of the day, I'm a duck hunter. You might find that the duck in our Duck Dogs podcast is spelt uniquely. The UK stands for my British labs. I love my British labs. I love what they offer me, both as a part of my family and the high motor in the field. As you're going to find, I have some pretty special dogs. Follow along in our podcast series here as we talk about both in the field hunting and in the field training situations that will hopefully help you progress with your dog at home. Thank you again to Yukonuba. You know, I always pump the the 3020, the premium performance sport 3020 blend. Uh, but that's just because that's what I use. A uh, number of blends out there, whether it's protein fat ratio, uh, whether it's flavor, uh, a lot of, a lot out there to choose from. So no matter what you're looking for, I would check them out. All high quality. I really believe in this food. Uh, again, go check out Yuganuba. Thank you to Sitka Gear. Uh, actually, I'm pretty pumped up. I got uh, I got a couple of the Sitka guys coming out to turkey hunt uh, on the kennels property or my property here at the kennel, I should say, uh, this week. So hopefully we can uh, we can chase down a bird or two. But uh, great people, great company, great products. Uh, so go check them out at www.sitkagear.com. So I want to start this week by telling a little story because it's so funny how small of a world, you know, things kind of become, especially in the dog world. You know, I think there's so many times that the dots connect when you never would expect them to. And, uh, this last you know, couple of weeks has definitely been, uh, one of those moments for me. And it's really kind of neat how this came about. So I get a phone call, uh, from a guy that I don't know him. And he had a, a dog that, uh, actually went through, uh, a gun situation. I'll briefly go over that. Um, the guy went to a, uh, I think I've maybe referenced this on last week's episode. I'm not, I can't recall, but, uh, took, took his puppy to a trainer and within the first hour of being out of the truck, you know, they're kind of, you know, talking about stuff. And, uh, the guy shot over the dog to quote unquote, see if it was gun shy, which I think is one of the craziest things I've ever heard. But we get more dogs that come in with gun shyness issues because of that thought process. And so uh, anyways, he brought the dog in and really kind of funny how it all ties up. So he uh, played baseball at the same college, you know, that I did. So naturally, we knew a lot of the same people. And, uh, it was really kind of neat to, you know, kind of sit back and relive some of the glory days. He would have been, oh, I think he would have been probably, you know, a few years after I was out, uh, that he came in as a freshman. Uh, but you know, but obviously a lot, a lot of same people, a lot of same culture around. So it was, it was just kind of fun to, to have that time. So, you know, spend a few weeks with his dog, get his dog back over, shooting the 12 gauge over him. Great. Uh, that is a process for those of you that, you know, have had that issue before, you know, it is at the dog's pace. You really have to take out, um, pull a lot of tricks out of the, out of your back pocket to make this, uh, you know, this successful, uh, would have much rather started with a blank slate without any issues, but all good. And, uh, you know, turned out great. Well, so he came to pick the dog up and naturally we're kind of, you know, sitting at the table talking about, you know, ball and college and everything like that. And we start talking about, uh, naturally dogs and hunting. And he, uh, had actually a dog background himself. He, he, uh, would throw birds for a guy that was a, uh, a field trial trainer and you know, had kind of a, a background in the retriever stuff. And it was really interesting. He starts talking about, um, this property. He starts talking about, you know, this property that has these beautiful tech ponds on. It was, it was you know, built up for training and all this stuff. And, it hits me what property this is. Now I, I haven't been on this property for probably 12 or 13 years. Um, but I got to go back on it this weekend and got to train on it. And it was really neat because, uh, as I've said before, I think sometimes you have to take your, your eyes off the finish line, look back at the starting line, and appreciate how far you know, you've come. Um, whether this is, you know, as a business, as a person, um, 
kind of, it, it, it just hit me. And here's why. So when I got done with school and I came back here uh, to Western Wisconsin, which is you know where I live now, I knew I want to start the kennel. I knew this was, you know, something I was going to, you know, leap into, uh, you know, just faithfully leaping into because I had nothing else to lean on but faith. And I was searching for uh, what would be my first home, but, or in my first house, but I needed, um, I needed a, a, a building or I needed, you know, something to where I could set it up to have the kennel to get this thing started. So there was a gentleman that was retiring. He had actually, I shouldn't even say retiring. Uh, he just wasn't going to be running his own business anymore. He took a job as a trainer down in the kennel in Missouri. Uh, his wife had still lived up here because she was a school teacher. And, uh, you know, they were just going to sell, you know, their house and, and kennel. And I think they had about, a, if I remember right, a 12-run kennel. Um, he was a a uh, smaller kennel, smaller house, uh, but it would have been absolutely perfect, you know, for me to get started in. My dilemma was I didn't have two nickels to rub together, let alone, um, you know, being able to purchase something that was being sold, uh, not only just as a house, but as a business. And yeah, I just could not make it work. And at the time, the same owners owned this property I'm referencing, which was probably from their house, I would guess 45 minutes from where my kennel is now. It's only about, you know, 15, 20 minutes. And uh, I remember just drooling over this property and thinking of all the things I could do if I could just have that property, if I could just have those ponds, what I'd be able to accomplish, what I'd be able to work on and train for and everything like that. And uh, I wanted in the worst way to buy this property. But one thing that I, I, today, as I sit today, I'm extremely proud of that nobody's ever given me a penny for anything. Yeah, I've, I've had to, you know, start from nothing. Everything I had is, is you know, or have today is because yeah, I've, I've worked for it. Uh, but at the time, I sure would have loved to have, loved to have somebody step in and be like, hey, you know, I'll, I'll front you, I'll back you, whatever. Because this property is gorgeous and it has everything you could you could ask for as far as, as a retriever trainer. And so going back to, you know, my sit down with, you know, my new client who's actually quickly becoming a friend. And, uh, so again, know, know which property, you know, he's talking about. And, um, he's like, well, my, my next door neighbor, he owns it. He's a vet. He bought it because he loves running his dogs, uh, in trials. He's really serious about training. Um, he just bought it as kind of like a recreation property. And, uh, you know, so you just kind of fun reminiscing about, well, he goes, Hey, he calls me after, I think it was the, the night that he took uh, his dog home. He sends me a text and he's like, Hey, uh, we are going out there on Saturday training. If you would like to join us, we'd love to have you. And it was just kind of neat, you know, being on that property just kind of made me step back and appreciate again, you know, this was probably 12, 13 years ago that I wanted that property in the worst way. And, you know, here I am fast forward again, 12, 13 years. Now I'm being able to go back and and train on that property. And, you know, it it was a journey, right? Like I, I kind of feel like, or I felt like this weekend that if, if I would have somehow been able to buy that property, it would have been being spoiled a little bit. You know, it would have been you know, walking into everything all set up, you know, completely done. Obviously, so I would have had to put the building up and everything because it's a vacant property. Um, but it, I think I appreciate it more, right? I think I appreciate uh, I appreciate where I've, I've gotten just because I've had to get creative. I've had to, you know, make drills up because of, you know, the limited water that I had. Uh, I've had to be creative. I have had to travel long distances just for, you know, training sessions, you know, just one training session. So, um, you just kind of need, I just thought, yeah, I'd share that because it, it's, uh, again, neat how, you know, this small circle, uh, continues to grow, but it's just, you know, also need to kind of have those, those, uh, you know, moments that remind you, you know, that, uh, you know, things are worth working for.
and it's really kind of neat, you know, to see that. So enough of that uh, quick story. Um, I want to thank Lucky Duck. Lucky Duck, if you guys have not seen the new large five-star crash test ready kennel, uh, do that because it is it is pretty sweet. Uh, but now they have intermediate and large, both five-star crash test rated. They are a fantastic, fantastic kennel if you're looking uh, for a kennel for your dog. So I'm going to... I'm going to lead into Gundog Supply. Um, I'll talk about them probably periodically throughout you know, this second half because I want to talk about tools. And of course, as you've listened to this podcast up to now, you know that uh, I really, um, I'm, I'm really a big uh, promoter of Gundog Supply just because I think there's just so few places that are dedicated to what it is that we love, which is hunting, training, working with our four-legged partners, four-legged hunting buddies, and four-legged family members. So I just, I love that. And I love that, you know, it's a family business. I love that they do just a fantastic job with customer service. So, um, so I love Gundog Supply, but they also have everything that it is that I'm going to talk about here as far as you know, equipment goes. And I don't want to talk about equipment in like a uh, hey, this company has this product, you should go buy it. I'm, I'm not going to talk about it like that. What I want to talk about are certain tools, why we have them, what they do for you, and what benefits you know they give, maybe what um, disadvantages you know, potentially they give you, and talk about um, you know, some of the stuff. Because this is something that as we have more and more clients that are now coming out to the kennel for training sessions, I'm having more aha moments of, Stuff that, quite frankly, I take for granted because I use the stuff every day. But I think it's good information for you to have and will certainly help you some of the stuff, um, especially one that I'm going to start off with. Knowing why something is made, why it is made, might make the difference between being successful or not you know, with that product. So let me jump into the first product I want to talk about, which is bumpers. This is something that so many of us use. We may not know why we use what we use as far as do you use rubber, do you use canvas, right? What size do you use? What color do you use? Everything like that. So let me go over this real quick because I think this is really interesting. So I love canvas bumpers. I love canvas bumpers for, no, for a number of reasons. You know, a lot of times people will say, well, yeah, because you can put scent on them. I'm not a big scent guy. I don't like, you know, rubbing, you know, or, uh, you know, we have that liquid scent is what we see a lot here, especially in the States. I'm not big on loading up my canvas bumpers with pheasant scent or duck scent or anything like that. Uh, I don't do that. What I love canvas bumpers for is I just feel that they are more of a true, real feel of what a bird would be like rather than rubber. Uh, I think it's just more natural. Uh, I like that. I do think it holds, uh, you know, perhaps some scent. Yeah, I guess you could use some of that as a uh, uh, benefit. But I, I love the real feel of it. Uh, I love that uh, a dog you can see much easier than with a rubber bumper. You can see if that dog is being soft mouthed versus being a little chompy with it because you're going to see in that canvas, you're going to see those indentions. Um, you might even, depending on how your canvas bumper is made, some of them have the uh, almost like that foam kind of pool noodle-ish you know, feel you know, on there. Um, sometimes you can even see some of those punctures if your dog is really being you know, hard on it. It just tells you more. And you just don't get that with the rubber. Now, I do use rubber bumpers, especially in the water when we're doing water work. Uh, I like that because the canvas bumpers, you know, they just, if you use them too often and, and they're wet and dry and wet and dry, they do tend to smell in my experience. And so I like using rubber and water and then I'm using canvas almost exclusively, uh, when I'm doing any kind of field work. Uh, and again, not that you, if you had to choose one or the other, um, I just lean towards canvas. It's not that you can't use canvas in the water. I mean, they, it, it floats, it does everything else. It's just a little bit of a disadvantage there. But here's the big one that I think is really interesting when it comes to uh, bumpers is the color. Sometimes people uh, don't know that there's a reason that bumpers are the color that they are. They're meant for different, uh, different tasks. So interesting enough to me, um, 
Well, first, let me go over what they are, okay? So, white. We use white bumpers anytime we're doing marks of any kind. So, we're throwing. We want the dog to be marking where that goes down. And it sees a drop. Um, we want them to be using their eyes, okay? They can see it. It's confidence building. Um, oftentimes, you can see it on the ground. It even helps them push all the way through, especially if you're sending marks out. White, they can see very easily. Orange, it disappears against most backgrounds because of the way that a dog sees in, in the, you know, the shades and the hues that they see. So it's amazing. Yeah, I get phone calls, not overly regular, but, you know, a few times a year. And as we talk about, um, you know, their dog, you know, they'll say something like, oh, I think my dog is just, I think he's just dumb. Like I can see that bumper sitting right next to him and he's sniffing around, he's trying to find it and he can't see it. Well, it's because he, he actually physically can't see it. <laughs> it's not that he's, he's un, you know, not intelligent. It's not, um, you know, that he's not using his eyes, but that orange does disappear, especially against green. Um, it really disappears against green for these dogs and you'll, you'll see it. I mean, you'll have times now you'll have times you swear you can see it. And I'm certainly not convinced that it completely disappears, but you will have times that, that dog was, is right next to that thing. And you're sitting there going, how do you not see that? And you just got to give them a second to kind of, you know, filter it out, find it, locate it and pick that up. That is because of that. And so what we do with our orange bumpers is we're using orange bumpers anytime we're doing blind retrieve work or anything that we want their eyes taken away from them. We do not want them using their eyes. We use orange to help that disappear to make, to make it so they either rely on their nose, rely on us, um, you know, number of ways there. But orange is when we do not want them using their eyes. The black and white, um, I guess I use black and white more uh, in the winter when we have snow just because, um, you know, going back to white, like we're using white when we're throwing marks, we want them to use their eyes. Well, it doesn't work real well when you're throwing it in the white snow, right? Um, so, so we'll use black and white, you know, when we have, um, when we have, uh, you know, snow on the ground or we want them again, we're using it as if it's a white bumper. Now, what it was initially made for was they called it a flasher. And the idea was that when you threw it in the air and it'd go white, black, white, black, white, white, black, yeah, say that 10 times fast. Oh my gosh. White, black, white, black, white, black. As you throw it, it was supposed to add somewhat of a strobe effect, somewhat like a duck flapping its wings in the air. Um, I don't know. I, I mean, I can see sometimes, you know, it's in the air and I'm like, oh, I can see how that looks like it. And, so, and most of the time, I'm like, yeah, you know, not really, but whatever. But that's why the black and white, or one of the reasons I should say that black and white um, was out there was for that. But it's so interesting to me because as I talk to, um, I haven't talked to uh, Steve Snell over at Gundog Supply about this for a while, but I know I talked to him about it, you know, a while back. I've talked to other retailers as I'm out there doing seminars and, and talk. Everybody says that orange overwhelmingly sells more than white. If you think about that, it should likely be the other way around because I can't imagine everybody that's buying orange bumpers is their dogs are at the level of running blinds and taking their eyes away from them. But we always buy things based on what we see, right? So like, like I know the ducks aren't looking at the minute details and decoys that I look for, right? Um, I would say the green paint, like the green paint is for me, right? The buyer is not for the ducks. It's for me. And this is the, the same way. Like you can see orange, you can see it really well when it's out there, right? That's why we buy orange because we can see it. The dogs can't. And so if you're using them for marks, um, you might be putting your dog at a disadvantage and you might be pulling your hair out or getting frustrated and you don't, you know, even realize it's, it's, it's not you, it's not the dog, it's the tools that you're using are just not being as productive as they can. So I think that's interesting. We have a lot of aha moments as we go through that bumper side of things. And, and, uh, again, sometimes using the correct tool is the make or break difference in this. Um, I want to go from bumpers into launchers. We have more and more people all the time that are training by themselves that are, uh, you know, getting very serious about training at home. I love 
that. As I've said before, I love when people train their own dogs, love when uh, people get in, into this at home. You don't have the timelines. You don't have the stress that comes from, you know, in my shoes, doing this on a professional level. Um, and I just think you appreciate, I think you, I think so many of you out there are, are loving and enjoying the process. And I love that. But a lot of times you get to a point that you need to have either another or more people, or you need to get other tools to help aid you, whether it's stretching these retrieves out, um, you know, throwing, you know, multiple. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that, uh, that launchers or another person would provide for you. But a lot of people, again, train on your own, you go to launchers. So I want to go over a couple, a couple launchers here because I know there's a few different styles and people always ask, hey, if I was to, to get one, what would I get? And that's a loaded and a tough question because it's all on what you're wanting. What are you looking for? Right. As far as, um, you know, are, are you looking for um, something that shoots, you know, has the percussion, has the noise um, you know, while it launches? Are you looking for something that maybe will throw something more than just a bumper in a, a duck or a pheasant, right? Um, let's go over these launchers. So there, there are, again, the, the shot I'm going to call launchers, which are, um, there's hand launchers. One, uh, some of them look like almost just like you have a handle and like a pull knob and you just, you know, pull that knob all the way back, let it go. Uh, that pin will hit the 22 blank, which will then fire and uh, shoot that that bumper. There is another hand style that looks or almost feels like a uh, a gun as far as it's got the shoulder pad. Uh, Retrieve our trainer, you know, makes one, and it's got you know the trigger, it's got everything, and you just basically almost aim it like a gun, pull the trigger um, again, pin shoots and and fires. This is a great tool or either of these are great tools uh, for, you know, someone that is just wanting to, they want to stretch out, you know, some marks. They, they don't want to, you know, get into, um, you know, the wingers, the electronics, the everything else, right? Something that this is pretty basic, but it will help you achieve you know, a few things, especially from the shot aspect. You know, some of us are nervous whether we had, you know, dogs that were maybe hesitant with the gun, uh, maybe uh, had some issues early on with the gun. They want to keep up with that gun and, and positively associating it with that retrieve. It's a great way to do that. Where we see issues or where we see people get frustrated is, especially with young dogs, if you take one of these hand launchers, the dog is sitting at your side and you shoot. If you have ever shot one of these before, they got to be coming out of that thing, you know, 150 miles an hour. That might be an exaggeration, right? But they are whipping out of that thing when you shoot. And when, when that shot goes off, again, a lot of young dogs will look up at you where the shot was, right? They, again, young dog has not done this before. doesn't know that it's looking out there for anything. So they hear the shot, they look up at you. Meanwhile, that thing is whipping way out in front of them. The dog doesn't see it. Now you get frustrated and the more frustrated you get, the more of an issue that it becomes and your dogs get stressed out too. So what I always say with this style of a launcher is take baby steps, have somebody shoot out in front of you, have somebody stand, even if it's just 10, 15 yards in front of you and shoot it out in, you know, same way, same direction, everything, but it's just allowing the dog to already be looking out and watch that leave, leave that gun, right? Watch it, leave that launcher so that they understand what's going on and then gradually work your way back to where you can get to the point you can shoot right beside them. Now, again, I, I get it. Some of you guys out there are like, well, my dog didn't have a problem with it. That's fine. But not all dogs are going to go through this flawlessly. Not all dogs are going to be you know, great with this. So like for us, we're, we're always looking at like anybody can do any of this stuff when everything goes great, you know? What can we do to help get over issues? And this is one of those issues that we do see or hear with a lot of young dogs. And this is a way to quickly and efficiently get over that. The other style of the, uh, I'm going to say the shot launcher, 
probably a poor way of describing this, but it's the same. You know, you're still putting in the 22 blank. Um, you're still, you know, firing. It's still, you know, using that shot, you know, to project that bumper. Um, there are a number of setups out there. I think, uh, again, retrieve our trainer has one, uh, bumper boy, uh, thunder has one. And, you know, some of these are propane driven. Some of these are the 22 blank driven, but it's the same idea, right? Where, you know, the shot goes off, the shot projects the bumper, but what's neat about this type of a setup is instead of out of your hand, you can set them up at a distance. And a lot of times if you get multiple shooters, so sometimes they come as one shooters, I think you can get them up to 10, 12, you know, 10, 11, 12, maybe even more. Actually, I think there's even a 16 shooter out there that you can have either pointed all in the same direction. You can point them different ways. So you can go, you know, one shoots left, one shoots right, work on doubles, whatever it is. This really allows you to expand on your training again, especially as a solo, you know, trainer. Uh, but there is some, um, I'm going to say some uh, downside, if you consider it a downside, is that you will have additional purchases with uh, electronics that you will need, you know, to put on these. And a lot of the big companies uh, that that make um, e collars, especially, have electronics. And you know, it's it's a pretty easy, basic thing, you know, to add on to it. But you will need to have that. Um, I I really like this option. Uh, I think I think it it is. Um, I think it, it it's a great aid for a lot of people. It does get expensive because you know the more that you add on, especially as you get into you know four or five plus arms and shooters, um, you know it it does get um, get more. It, it gets costly, but it really helps you. Know, it saves a ton of time, you know, especially if you have. Let's just say if you're working multiple dogs, you don't have to go reset every time. Which like we'll get into it with the wingers. That's the big downside I think of the wingers. But you don't have to, you know, reset. You can, you know, you can do one dog, put that dog away, bring the next dog out, do the exact same drill, not have to reset, not have to go, um, you know, walk down there. It, it's it's really a time saver, and I think that there's a lot of positives, you know, about that. Um, as we go to wingers, as I had mentioned, so wingers, for those of you that are unfamiliar, wingers fold out in a frame. They stand. It depends on which you know size you get, but I'd say anywhere from maybe four to five feet tall and they have big it's basically like a um trampoline is the wrong idea or the wrong way that i'm trying to describe it but basically there's there's a piece of fabric that that connects down to uh the pot the the bottom spring point so you you connect that down and there's four rubber bands that get really tight and you pull those down you clip them on and again, remote driven, uh, you set, you know, whatever, if, you know, a duck, a bumper or whatever you want to throw in that, um, that, that, that fabric that is there. And then whenever you're ready, you know, you hit that electronic and it's slingshots, whatever it is that you're looking for up in the air. Pros and cons. Pros are, I think it's very versatile as far as, again, you can use ducks you can use bumpers you can use whatever you want in there where with the previous launchers that i mentioned uh, you really are stuck with just those bumpers and and not only just the bumpers you know just bumpers but bumpers that are specifically made for those tools so we are limited a little bit on what you can use but with the wingers it adds that versatility negatives with the wingers is that it will require you to reset every single time you use it um, it just kind of gets to be a pain time consumption wise. Um, they, I, I don't want to say they're dangerous, but I have had two different times that those rubber bands have snapped and I get big, uh, big, um, just wicked, you know, welts on my face, you know, from where it smacked back. And now you take care of your rubber bands, you know, mine tend to get abused. They tend to be in the weather nonstop. They tend to break down faster. I'd say the most, So I wouldn't say that's a common thing, but it is something you should consider, especially if you have, you know, maybe a kid that is helping you something like that. Like I have, um, 
I, I usually have a group of, of high school kids that come out in the summer and they help, you know, with chores and throwing birds and everything else. And I do not let them set, you know, these wingers just because I'm fearful of that. But I will say of all these launchers, I tend to use the wingers the most. Now, I feel like I tend to use the wingers the most because I really like using ducks. I really like using live birds. And it just, that's the only option that I really have. Now, sometimes uh, I get a little pushback on bird launchers and how, you know, you could set up a bird launcher, screw the, the springs on super tight, kick it off at an angle, and essentially do the same thing that a winger is doing. Eh, not really. I mean, okay, maybe to an extent, but it is not, it's not made for that, right? A bird launcher is made to me for pointing dogs is meant to contain a bird and is meant to release that bird uh, on command, of course, with the, uh, sometimes there's a pull string, but a lot of times it's electronic nowadays. And the reason I say it's for, for a pointing dog is because I've seen way too many times that people aren't fast enough on that button and that flushing dog gets right in close to there and all of a sudden, whap, 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 you know, that thing flips open, smacks him in the face, you know, do we create a bird shyness issue? Do we create, you know, blinking birds? I mean, there could be a number of things that come up as repercussions of that. And I just don't like, I just don't like it. I just think there's too much risk. And I think that risk out, outweighs the possible reward. Um, but throttling back to, uh, to the tool, um, great tool. I just think it's not, it's not made for what we are talking about as far as launchers to throw marks. It's just not made for it. So, you know, those are the types of, of launchers that I think, um, you know, I would look at. And, yeah, you know, it's, it's again, to each their own, what is it that you are looking for? What is it that that uh, fits your needs? And I think that's what you go with. Um, whistles. So I get a lot of, of questions on whistles, mainly because I breed British labs. I love my British labs, and I do not use very often at all a British whistle. Um, it's like, guys, it's, it's not, it's, it's not like the, uh, I don't have to be, you know, page 42 out of the, uh, the Scotsman's, uh, or the, the English hunters, you know, playbook. I mean, that it's, it's, it's just not the right fit for me. It's not the right fit. I don't believe it's quite frankly the right fit for our application and use here. Now, here's what I will say. I love that they're quiet, the British style whistle. I love that they're quieter. Um, I think they're great for how they're used overseas. You know, they use them in trials. Um, I love that they try to be quiet. I think we've talked about that in the past is, you know, personally, I'm a quiet handler. I love that side of it. But I just don't think for us, especially as waterfowlers, that um, I think it can get us into trouble because it's not loud enough at times. And the reason I say that is um, we do so much water work here in the States. And there are so many times that when we're out in the field, not only are we in water, which if it is any, if it's swim water, it's a little different. You know, they can, um, you hear a little better on that. But when you're talking splash water or lunge water, when it's kukush, 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 and then you start adding the wind into it. And, and I have had multiple times where I've been out in the field with someone that is handling a dog with a British style whistle. That dog is out there a long ways and they just, they can't hear it. Just with the element of the situation. Again, I think it's a great tool if it is, is something that, uh, that fits you. Like if you are an upland guy, your dog is working close to you, I think it's awesome. Like why would you want to be loud? I'd want to be quiet, but I just like to be able to reach out and talk with my dogs when I need to in all those elements is why I personally don't use it. Um, don't use it much. I should say I, I, we have clients that do want to use it and we train you know, with it. Um, but I use, um, I use a peed whistle, um, just personal preference. I use a peed whistle with a cone on the end of it. And so there's a lot of, uh, a lot of brands out there that have, you know, the cone. I personally use a sport dog whistle that has the cone on it. Two reasons why I use the cone. Uh, one, again, just noise projection. If I need to get super loud in a situation, I have it, but the real reason is for my ears. You know, I, I am blowing that whistle. 
I mean, literally for my living, right? It's all day, uh, you know, all basically, you know, five, six, seven days a week. And I like my ears just get hammered and I can't wear hearing protection. I can't wear even the noise canceling when you get over a certain decibel because it, it cuts out, you know, the whistle when I'm blowing it, it just messes with me. So I, I just personally can't use it. And I have found that that cone just protects my ears. That's the biggest reason that I use it. And so that's why, you know, whistle wise, um, you know, I, I think, you know, the next question would be P versus P list. Um, I think P list, the big advantage is, is that it's not going to freeze up on you uh, as you get into late season. You know, that's the only issue with the P I just have, for whatever reason, just always use, you know, the P whistle and I'm just kind of stubborn and don't like changing if I don't feel like there's a need to. So, um, plus that pitch, golly, that, that P list pitch to me, it just, it just gets my ears. So, um, so those are the reasons that's just a personal. I, I have no issue if you use, you know, a P list. I have no issue if you use a, a bridge to whistle, but just, you know, kind of have an idea of, uh, of what, what applies to you, right? I guess where I'm going with this is just because you purchased a British lab doesn't mean that you have to use that, you know, use what is right for you. I know I'm going to get messages from my, my, my buddies from overseas going, you know, cause they love the quietness of, of that whistle. And, and like I said, so do I, I really do. Um, but when my friends from overseas have come here and have hunted with me, have trained with me, I, they, they see it too. I mean, we just, although we're using our dogs in a very similar fashion, the way that we use them specifically hunting wise, it is very different in a lot of ways. And so, you know, that's kind of where, where, uh, you know, it, it's just kind of fun for me to visit them, them visit me because we can see these, these types of things firsthand. It's pretty neat. But just for all you guys out there, you know who you are. <laughs> I'm fully, I am fully, uh, expecting the messages. So have at it. A <laughs> uh, couple of other things that I thought was interesting. So poppers, a lot of times we want, you know, we, we as trainers, uh, we want to be using the gun. Um, I know for us, especially as we you know gear up for competition season, we use the guns to start having the dog follow the gun, uh, follow the gun mark to mark. And one, I don't want to be shooting live rounds all day uh, for my shoulder, for my ears, for the dog's ears. But we still have to have that noise. I love poppers. Um, I'm not saying poppers are a replacement for... Uh, for live rounds, especially if your dog has not gone through gun introduction, you need to do that. And I'm not saying don't mix in live rounds every once in a while so that, that you don't freak them out come opening day. But uh, poppers are a great way to still get the noise, to still work on steadiness, to work on everything. Poppers are simply uh, a 12-gauge hull with a 22 primer in there, and it just it sends the primer off. So it's still the noise. Um it's just not the big boom, you know, that a live round would have. And you can get those right from Gun Dog Supply. I think we order them by like the thousands. I think they have a thousand pack. I think we order them by the thousands because we use so many of them. But they're a great tool, a great way that you can still use the gun. You can still do your gun work, uh, but you're not having to kill your children, kill your ears, kill your dog's ears. So it's all uh, all good stuff. The, I, I get an interesting number of comments on my blind stakes. And... Uh, so I want to talk about those for a half second because my, I use, um, sometimes, uh, I think we think these have to be like super special tools and uh, oftentimes they're not, but when I say blind stakes, I mean the stakes that I use to mark my, where my blinds are set and I need to do that, you know, because especially on new properties, if I come back, you know, I set my, my setup up and I come back and I'm, you know, 150 yards away from where my blind is set. If I don't know right where that is, then I'm probably doing the dog a, a disservice because I could be handling him to the wrong spot, right? Not ultimately getting him that uh, that reward, which means he's going to get frustrated, which means I'm going to get frustrated, which means we're going to move backwards. It's just not a great thing. So I have to know where they are. Um, so I just use, uh, you might not have them in the south or, or anywhere you don't have snow, but we use them all the time, which are just, they're, they're little orange rods, you know, you can get them, I think, I mean, they're, they're about this, the, um, maybe about a pen, 
uh, you think about an ink pen, probably about that that uh, diameter, I would guess, roughly. And you can get them, you know, three foot, four foot, five foot, six foot high. And but you know they're orange, so again, I can see where they are. The dogs can't. And you know, it, it's one of those things that um, again, I just I need to know where they are, but I don't want the dog using his eyes on those blinds. And so, you know, a lot of people think that that's interesting for some reason <laughs> that I use those. Uh, you see them a lot if, if there's a uh, if there's anyone out there that hunt tests, you will see those at hunt tests. Uh, funny story about that. Uh, Brock, who you guys probably know by now, um, one of my very special dogs, but Brock failed a hunt test. This was probably two, three years ago now. And uh, he failed a test because he aligned the blind which is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. And um, I didn't get upset. It takes me a lot to get upset. I probably should have gotten upset. A lot of people would have gotten upset. I did not. I was irritated, but whatever. It's just not worth fighting about. But uh, he ran the test perfectly. Um, goes to run the blind. I line him up. You know, you know, runs, lines it. Great. And the judges told me that I, I should have stopped him to show and prove that I had control over him. He lined the blind. That's as much control as you could ask for. I mean, he did everything perfectly in a live hunting situation. Wouldn't you want to be as as quick, as efficient, as quiet as possible? I think so. Anyway, the very next weekend, we're at a different test, different state. They go. Uh, if you don't, if you're unfamiliar with hunt tests, they always show you the test, show you what they're going to do, and then they say, "Are there any questions?" So me, still feeling stung from the weekend before, raise my hand and say. Will we get failed for lining the blind? And the, the judges look at each other. And they're like, why would we fail you for lining the blind? I was like, I don't know. I got failed for last weekend. I just want to ask. And, uh, you know, the one, the, uh, two judges, one was a uh, lady and she's like, no, absolutely not. And the gentleman who was next to her laughed and he's like, he's like, if you can line this blind, go ahead and line it. But, and he just left it at, but I was like, okay, whatever. So, we run, Brock runs a great test. We go to the blind, and it was a tough blind, but go to the blind, line him up, you know, back, off he goes. Brock is running full bore, as he always does, and he put that dri that that driveway stake, you know, just what I call my blind stake, he literally hit himself between the eyes with it, and you, you could hear the whack from all the way at the line. I mean, he hit that thing so hard. Um, now it's flexible, so it didn't hurt him at all. It just, you know, flexed back, but that's how hard he was running. You know, just, you know, just bounce back. So of course, when he hits it, he smells it, you know, picks it up, you know, brings it back. And the guy goes, oh my gosh. He's like, you were not joking about him lining. And I was like, well, <laughs> that's him. You know, he's a, he's a, he's a line runner for sure. And, uh, so anyways, that's kind of my, my funny blind stake, um, you know, story, but that's, that blind stake is something that I use a lot is something that I probably have, I probably have 15 of them in the trailer all the time, just because I'm always using them for something, but, uh, but blind stakes, you know, it's, it's easy, but it's something that I think you should have. If you're at that level, always know where your blinds are at. Um, the, the orange you know, bumpers, if you can see them, those work to an extent, but, um, always know where they're at because it's it's just not fair to the dog to be handling them to maybe the wrong spot. We've all done it, but you know, just a little tool that you can use to help you. Um, I've been rambling now for quite some time, uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna cut it all off here. But I hope you guys uh, enjoyed this piece of it because I think you know these tools. It's just stuff that I continue to see questions on. It's stuff that I, that, uh, I continue to see aha moments on, which I love. Hopefully you had one of those uh, aha moments throughout, uh, you know, throughout this course. And if you guys ever have anything that you want to uh, to hear about, you know, shoot me over a message. Shoot me an email, uh, josh at riverstonekennels.com. Shoot me a message on Instagram at riverstonekennels. Uh, you can all also follow my personal one and send me one there. Some people do that as well. But uh, I want to thank everyone for their time, and you guys have a great, great week, and I'll talk to you next week. Thanks for listening. Be sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Leave us a review on iTunes, and a special thank you to Yukonuba, because without them, we couldn't do what we do here, bringing this information to you.